Hello there, my friends. Salamun alaikum. I just want to deal with a question here that I received, and I think it's good if I answer it for everyone's uh, benefit. So here's the question. Um, I want to start reading the Quran, the English translation, to my kids. The youngest is eight, but I don't know where to start because the order in which the Quran is arranged confuses me. Kids have short attention spans, so I plan to start with only five minutes a day. Where would you recommend I start? I don't understand Arabic, and I'm trying really hard to understand, but my grasp of the Quran is not as strong as others. Okay, so let me let me just respond to the question there. <clears throat> Look, of course, the reason I've gone into a translation of the Qur'an is because I find I found so much of the Qur'an being written from the perspective of historical narratives. Now, I don't, if you've watched my videos, I'm not an extremist who rejects any notion of um, historical narratives, right? I believe that history is there and um, we use the stories about the past to reinforce our understanding of history but um, I'm also very clear in my position that there is no other sacred divine text except the Quran so any other narrative hadith in other words can be scrutinized can be vetted can be studied not for its sacred value but for historical value or for the value of improving practice, but you cannot place it in the realm of the divine word. So the problem I have is that too much of the Quran has been written and twisted to match the Hadith narrative. And we've made a few examples on this channel. For example, the term Salah, the term um, Taqwa, the term uh, Mu'min, the term Muslim. These are all terms, or the term Kafir, you see. These are all terms that need to be read purely from a Quranic perspective and not from a Hadith perspective. Because if you read it from a Hadith perspective, you, you trap the Quran within the 7th and the 8th century. You trap the understanding there. You, you restrict the understanding to the 8th and the 9th centuries. Another example is the word milkul yamin. Now, that meaning is also trapped in the 8th century of slavery and of concubinage. And today, we, we have rejected forever the idea of slavery and of concubines. Do we just simply discard those verses? So we cannot read the Quran from the perspective of a thousand-year-old narratives. The Arabic, the Quran, has the power of making sense and having meaning throughout all times. Now, and it, and you don't have to become creative for the words. You see, all you need to do is read the Quran for what it is. Now, the idea of milkul yamin, for example, it means what your right hand has attained, mil, what you have obtained via your right hand. Now, that is pure uh, um, sort of a figurative way of saying what you have agreed to, what you have agreed to. In other words, today we use the right hand to shake on, right? When we shake hands, that is the symbol for an agreement or a signature. We sign with our right hand. And to say milkulia mean what your right hand has brought to you or have made you, gave you possession over or control over or um, usage over, is milkul yamin and milkul yamin then leave it 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 doesn't require the idea of slavery for example and in my case coming to the translation that i've done uh, what i've then translated it simply is not to say your concubines for example when i translate milkul yamin in the translation that i've done i simply put there what you write what you have obtained contractually what you have come about contractually. It's simple. You see what I mean? So I've, I've liberated the meaning from the 8th century and for those times, we, times that we cannot repeat. You can never repeat the 8th century 
in a, thou a thousand years later. And even in a hundred years, wise men and people who are capable will reread the Quran and will make it work for their times. And this, the core message, the core meaning is eternal. It can never change. The, the meaning of La ilaha illallah can never change. You understand what I'm saying? But there are certain elements within our practice that we will re-look re at as humanity evolves, so our understanding of the Qur'an will evolve. As our knowledge evolves, so our insight, our depth of understanding of the Holy Qur'an will evolve. And that is why it's a sacred and timeless book. So let me come to the question of this uh, dear good brother or sister, I'm not sure, that uh, has written to me. So the question is, how do I read the Quran? Now let me come to that. I will, of course, recommend the work that I've produced because I feel confident that I've been able to compare with a number of other translations, including modern translations, including Quranist translations, and I had no prejudice in looking at the translations of Sam Guerin's the monotheist group, Sheikh Al-Asi, I have Sheikh Al-Asi set here, you can see it's this set here behind me. Um, so I have no problems having read or having compared all these translations with, uh, with the text or the meaning that I've uh, uh, found in the text. But of course, you are always, always encouraged to read the text and if it doesn't gel with you, if you feel it doesn't really sound right, then you are always free to go and compare with the tens of other translations that exist in English. And, of course, to go to the Arabic diction and try to empower yourself also. So let me come to the question. You see, this is a very tough one because I've also experienced that. And maybe we are too polite to say what this brother <laughs> has said, is that it's it's almost like an, a different piece of literature. You know, it's not literature as we are familiar with it. Like even if you open the Bible, it says in the beginning, uh, you know, uh, and 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 it starts reading like a like a nice narrative. I have the Bible. You have read a uh, fair part of it. Um, Old and New Testament, they all read as beautiful stories, except the Psalms. The Psalms would be more similar to the Quran, maybe, this, the Psalms of David in the Old Testament. So the Psalms would be more like, like almost like a, like a dhikr, <laughs> you know, Muslims have dhikrs, as like a book of praises of God. So the, the, how, how do we read the Quran? How do we get into the reading of the Quran? Now, my suggestion is, you see, the Qur'an is not laid out in a long narrative. The Qur'an, you must think of as a series of about, um, let's say, um, 600 lectures. Right? That is what the Qur'an would resemble, about 600 lectures. Now, the lectures would normally span about 6 to 10 verses. So there's, there's short topics. Topics are covered over six to ten verses. Sometimes more. I'm not saying, you know, sometimes it could be 20 verses. So the way to break the Quran up, the, the unit of understanding would be to read those topics, to cover those topics. Now I'm going to give you an example, right? So uh, let's, let's just quickly, there's this surah, Fatiha, which is, uh, I think, let, let's just quickly leave Surah Fatiha aside for now. And then we'll look at, we will look at uh, some of the other Surahs. Surah Fatiha, of course, is the very first Surah or chapter that I will say that every person needs to memorize. And your children should know this by heart. This is the one chapter of in the whole Qur'an that is almost like, I think, obligatory to memorize. Now, the, the chapter is a, is a gift. It is a gift of a prayer. Right? It, is, it is almost like the whole thing is in inverted commas. So if you want to think of the Qur'an as 
of course, no punctuation, which is the other problem. So if you read the English, at least you see the punctuation. So some of the so, so the Fatiha is in fact the whole Fatiha has to be in 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 inverted in quotes, right? Because it is it is it is almost like saying to you, "Here is a prayer." And um, so besides the Fatiha, let's quickly move to a a chapter like a full normal chapter, and then we have a chapter like Surah Bakara. How do you spend five minutes with your children reading this? Now, my suggestion is the following. Um, the Quran is not a free... It, it, it reads better if we relate it to the world around us. So how will I do it with my children? I will, I will read the verses and then reflect on the world around us and then try to give meaning, contemporary or, or, or real life meaning to the verses. Let me show you how I, how, how I normally do it. And I'm, not, I'm not going to make this a long video, so I'll just quickly give you an idea. Like Surah 2, Surah Baqarah. Of course, if you can read the Arabic, that's even better. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alif Lam Mim. Now, unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to get every time into little points, but what, what is Alif Lam Mim? What is Alif Lam Mim? That is what is called the uh, Huruful uh, Muqatta'at. It is the abbreviated letters. And um, I just need to say something quickly about this. The best explanation so far that I have found is that the abbreviated letters are actually have meaning. But uh, they have meaning in an old Arabic sense where a letter like Alif, Lam and Mim were also words. So in the old Syriac, these letters would have meaning. And in Alif, Lam, Mim's case, it would mean pay careful attention. Right? So I'm just saying to you that there is meaning to these letters. There is already people there have already people are doing the necessary research and they have applied amazing uh, you know just and it it's a completely completely transparent process. They're not making it up, they're not inventing like things out of their own head. They take the alif, they go to the Syriac dictionary and it says, you know, like sit up and pay attention and you and you can directly relate each letter to a word in the Syriac, the old Syriac dictionaries, which is a proto-Arabic, I think it is just old pre-Arabic Arabic. And so I'm not saying that's the meaning, but for me, you can just go on and say Alif Lam Mim, but for me, I have now found an amazing explanation for the Alif Lam Mim, for example, which is, you know, sit up, pay attention, and, you know, the, uh, for this important message. So let's just quickly go with, let's stick with Alif Lam Mim, you, um, and I will make a, maybe a, I will maybe recommend a video on that explanation. If we are to read this verse, these verses, the set of, let me just see, quickly see. I think I will say from verse 1 to verse 7 would be a very logical series of verses. Right? Verse 1 to verse 7 would for me be a, um, a, a, a sort of a coherent set of verses where there is a single meaning coming out. Let's just quickly look at that meaning. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alif Lam Mim Zalikal Kitabula Ray Bafi Hudalil Muttaqeen Aladina Yukminuna Bil Raibi wa Yukimuna Salata wa Mimma Razakana Hum Yunfikun. والذين يؤمنون بما أنزل إليك وما أنزل من قبلك وبالآخرة هم يوقنون. Let me just read the Arabic till then. I'll, I'll, I'll go through the English with you. In the name of the one true God, Ar-Rahman the Kind, Alif Lam Mim. 
according to my translation, I, I use Ar-Rahman in some places as a proper noun. Because I do think Allah says in one place, call me by the name Allah or call me by the name Ar-Rahman. Now, Ar-Rahman has a meaning. It means the, the, uh, the, the, the cosmic provider. In this particular verse, I've translated it here, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the primordial benefactor. So in other words, the primary benefactor, the one who sources everything, who, from who everyone is resourced from. Right? But I think just to stick to the name Ar-Rahman, and, and treat it like a proper noun here. In the name of the one true God, and I've translated Allah also, sometimes not as a noun, because Allah is also not always a noun. Sometimes it refers to just the one true God, Allah. Because Ilah means God, and Al-Ilah means the one true God. So in my understanding my reading i've translated it as i saw it fitting best that's why i recommend this translation in the name of the one true god ar-rahman the kind alif lam mim here follows the written code devoid of doubt a means of guidance for those with concern so can you see that ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رِيبَ فِيهُ دَلِّ الْمُتَّقِينَ I have had to translate mutaqin as those with concern because this is somebody reading the Qur'an. Let's assume that this person is not even a Muslim. Let's assume this person is just taking an interest in Islam. So that means that person is, is, is developing a concern for the world, for himself, for his family for nature, for everything. And with that sense of concern, he approaches the book, right? Here follows the written code, devoid of doubt, a means of guidance for those with concern. Those who embrace the transcendent, who establish joint observance, and who are charitable with what we provide to them. Also those who embrace what was revealed to you and was revealed before your time and who regarding the life hereafter, possess conviction. Such are the ones under guidance from their Lord and Sustainer, and such are the ones who will prosper. Indeed, for those who obscure the truth, it matters not whether you caution them or not, they will not endorse. God blocked their minds and their ears. Over their vision there is a screen. For them there is an extreme penalty. So I believe that up till verse 7, it makes good sense. Now, if you're going to be reading for your children, you might want to go on a bit and just make sure that that is indeed a coherent idea or a set of verses. right? So what I will then do is, after reading it, I will reflect, because that's what the Quran, the Quran is not a book for lazy people. It's, not, it, it, it's a book that, con, that sets your mind in action. And so what, what I've just read here, and I'll, I'll put this like this to my children. This is a, a book that offers the way forward, how to live, how to act, how to structure yourselves. It's a formula, it's a code. It, it, is, it is without any doubt. It is, it is perfect in its formulation, right? So that is what I will first come to. And then maybe one can reflect on alternative books would always be subject to some sort of um, prone to some sort of error or in or, 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 or lack of uh, sort of certainty. This one has got no no uncertainty. So it goes on to say, who are the people who will find this book interesting or acceptable? It, it is people who are prepared to embrace that there is more than just this world. That there is something beyond right so it is not somebody who is caught in a a, a, a a an empirical or in in a life a material world somebody who postulates or, or is prepared to entertain that there is a world and a life and an existence beyond this earthly dimension right we establish joint observance 
who are prepared to create a system of adherence with others, who are prepared to fall in line with others that are doing the right thing, and who are charitable. So it is the, the image that is created here in verse 3 is of a person who, has, who is otherworldly, who is not caught or trapped within this worldly understanding, who is prepared to work with others, who is a team work, team player, who goes, who is prepared to work with the rest of humanity, and who are charitable with anything they possess, who are not stingy or hoarding or selfish. Now I know the meaning here says salah, but you must remember that is the expanded meaning of salah. Right? So the word here is so the reduced meaning, the diminished meaning is to have prayers. Why would God in the third verse of this noble great book tell people about a, 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 a detailed practice? No, the message is broad at this point. Also those, I'm going to verse 4, also those embrace what was revealed to you and was revealed before your time and regarding the life hereafter, possess conviction. So this is linking the present message with historical, a historical series of communiques. So the message that we know now is handed to the Prophet Muhammad salam. That is what we know from history. He is the recipient of these verses, of these uh, amazing, miraculous lines. Um, he is assured that this is not something that happens in a historical vacuum, that there's been a series of communiques that precede he, him, precedes you. In other words, the you here, speaking to the recipient, Muhammad, and who... Um, the, the next qualification is, so, so those who accept this book must also accept all the past communiques and must also accept that there is a life that will follow this earthly life. So that was a beautiful quick summary, right, in, the, in verses 3 and 4, it sketches the nature of the person that is welcome here to, to embrace this book. It is somebody who believes in the beyond. It is somebody who is prepared to collaborate with others. It is somebody who is charitable. It is somebody who links up with all the past scriptures. It is somebody who has a vision of the year after. That is the fourth verse. And then the, the payoff comes in verse 5. Such are the ones under guidance from their Lord and sustainer, their Rabb, and such are the ones who will prosper. So that is the payoff there, is that in this case, if you should be one of these that will adopt this book, embrace this code, then this is the payoff. You will then be guided. You will find your way. You have a GPS. You see, there's a GPS for you. You're not going to be lost. You're not going to wake up confused. What am I doing here? What is my purpose? You will be directed, you will have a direction, and you will prosper. So the pros muflihun, prosper, prosperity is not just in the year after. Please, folks, the Quran is a formula for, for prosperity on earth, human flourishing. If the, if the code is implemented there, you will flourish. I promise you that. I guarantee you that because Allah guarantees it and he's not a liar. So for prosperity to flourish, this is the formula. Indeed, and then a, always, as the Quran always does, is on verse in verse six, it gives it sounds a warning. Indeed, for those who obscure, it matters not whether you caution them or not; they will not endorse. So those who are obscuring, alladina kafaru, sawaun alayhim. They are, they've decided that they will obscure this message. And your warnings and your pleas 
will fall on deaf ears. Why? Because God blocked their minds and their ears. And I've translated kolubum, kolubim, as minds, the faculty of thinking, of contemplation, right? Kolub. The Quran uses the word heart. But based on my own research, the, the word mind is very synony synonymous with the way the word kulub is used in the Quran. It is always ref refers to the faculty of thinking. So God blocked their minds and their ears over their vision. There is a screen for them. There is an extreme penalty. So those who have decided to obstruct, to obscure this message, are doomed. They will not find the truth because they lack the sincerity. They lack all of these qualities, the qualities of generosity, the quality of having an open mind, the quality of looking forward to the next life. They lack all of those qualities. And so, as providence goes, they are blocked from any benefit. So that is the, that is the seven verses that I've read here. And as you can see, it, the Quran almost forces you to reflect on the real world around us. And um, I'm not sure, but I hope that has been useful for you, looking to try and start reading the Quran. And that would be a, a nice 5 to 15 minute exercise to just read the words and to just reflect on them and to make sense of it. And with that, of course, the Quran requires a good general knowledge. The Quran reads better with general knowledge. The Quran reads better if you know what's going on in your society, if you know what's going on in science, if you know what's going on in mathematics. Not 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 a deep knowledge, but the more you know, the better. The, if you know something about history, you see the Quran reads better. The Quran prompts, is full of prompts. It will prompt you of an event in history. It will say, for example, recall the time when God parted the ocean with you. And then what we can then do is we can then consult maybe the ancient books and see what is the story with the ocean having been parted. Um, of course, um, nobody has the full truth about history. And we always, we always humble when we read the Quran. We don't make absolute claims. And so even when I speak about my translation, I'm not claiming this is the absolute meaning of the words. This is my sincere attempt at deriving meaning which I'm offering to you. And I hope that is useful. So I think that is the process that I would recommend that you use. So what I'm going to do is on this video, I will attach a link to the drive where, this, where, where the um, translation, translation is constantly being updated. There's eight, six full surahs. Sorry, there's a, there's a not, lot more than six surahs. Maybe 30, 40, 50 surahs done. Uh, so I would say um, you use the surahs that are done. And uh, if you have any queries, please, there's an email address on this download. Feel free to contact me via email if you have any questions about my translation. But it will be in the, um, the, 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 the section of this video. You know, the what do you call that section on top, the details of the video. I'll put the link there. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen.